So Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he, saw, he was glad and encouraged them all that, that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in, th in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Holy Spirit, uh, showed by the Spirit, that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren uh, dwelling in Judea. This they also did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Let's pray. Yeah, Lord, we just thank you so much for this amazing text, Lord. Um, just thank you for what you're going to do in this time, and just pray that you really, really speak to us. Um, thank you for the fact that it wasn't just the Jews um, that that, was, that salvation was for. Uh, thank you, Lord, for loving us uh, Gentiles uh, just as much, Lord God, and just thank you for your desire to, to save us and to be with us and, and to have a relationship with us, Lord God. So, yeah, thank you for this amazing gift of salvation of you. Of, uh, of your presence, Lord, and we just we just pray that you really speak to us, uh, speak through Jaden, Lord, right now and in this time, and be glorified in your beautiful name, Jesus. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bruno. One thing I forgot to ask: if anyone doesn't have a Bible and wants a Bible, we can get one to you. Someone will get get one for you. All right. All right. So if all good. Yeah, so that's our text today. So yeah, it's actually, I mean, that is actually, like, it's pretty small, but it's actually pretty important in terms of the book of Acts, like, where this text comes. Like, we've seen so far, so we're in chapter 11 now, over a 28-chapter book, we've seen so far the gospel going out from Jerusalem and going further and further and further out. People, more and more people being saved, further and further ethnically removed and even spiritually removed from the Jews. So this is kind of like our next stop in the book, and it's a big one. It's, Ant it's, at, it's the church. This, in this chapter, the church gets planted in Antioch. And at the Antioch church will actually become an important church um, in a lot of ways. It will become important in the early century. It also will also it'll be the missionary base for Paul throughout the rest of Acts. You know, he's going to go out and come back to Antioch. And reading this chapter, we just see a few things. We see the church, be it how it's planted, who plants it, and we see it being built up, who builds it up, and we see how it's built up. And we see the church actually already start to bear fruit. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty small, but it's a lot that happens in this. But let's start with... Um, so the first thing we see. Now those who were scattered after that persecution that arose of Stephen, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. But they were preaching the, Jew, the word to no one except Jews only. But some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, so they, when they came to Antioch, they, they, were, they spoke to the Hellenists, and then they got saved. And because the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So this is really, like these guys, we don't even have a name. These, are, these guys are the first people that we see really actually just going out and targeting the Gentiles with the gospel. Um, I mean, Peter kind of almost got dragged to Cornelius, and he was a Gentile, but... These guys are actually going out, some of these guys, at first some of them were preaching only to Jews, but then some of these guys actually went out and just were targeting Gentiles with the gospel. So it's a bit of the story so far, you know. So we had that Jesus gave the commission to the apostles in, in um, Acts 1.8 that they were to go and be his witnesses to Jerusalem, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. 
So at Pente- in Pentecost, we had Peter go out. You know, he began his address, address to the men of Israel. So these were Jews and proselytes who were coming to... Um, th- these are the priests, Jews and proselytes who were coming to Jerusalem for the feast. And then he was preaching to them, and they preached. And many of them got saved, and the church... Many of them were added to the church that day. Um, so that's, that was in his Pentecost sermon. And then we also see other people included in that, in the kind of the, the church. In Acts 6, we see Stephen and other Greek-speaking Jews uh, as part of that, Hellenists. And we also see proselytes. So proselytes are people who would have been con- converts to Judaism. These would have included Nicholas, who was in, um, included among the seven chosen to serve with Stephen. Um, and also, which maybe came as a bit of the Jew, uh, a bit of a surprise to some of the apostles and the, or some of the Jews, Phil, when Philip preached to the Samaritans, they received the gospel. Um, so that's a, like another further removal from the Jewish people. And then in the last chapter, yeah, like we see, we saw Cornelius, and he was a Gentile. But you could even say, like Cornelius, he was a Gentile, but he was, you know, he was devout. Like he prayed. It even says in Acts chapter ten twenty two, he was a righteous and God fearing man. So you could say, yeah, he was a Gentile, but he was an exception. But now this time, this is, there's, no, there's no exception, there's no qualification. These guys are just Hellenists. They're, they're, just Greek, they're just Greeks. There's nothing special about them. This is just people being saved um, who are not Jewish at all and have nothing really to qualify them in that sense. And just, to, the word Hellen, just a quick note, the word Hellenist, like it really it means anyone speaking the Greek language. So it could be Greek-speaking Jews, but we know from the context that it's not because it's contrasted against the people in verse 19 who are preaching to Jews only. So you don't say, I'm preaching to Jews only, but these people came and they're also preaching to Jews. It doesn't really make sense. So the context, in the context, really, it's that these people were Greeks who were being preached to, and this was like a new thing. So this church that would be planted in Antioch is was, was 300 miles north of Jerusalem. Like I said, this would be the missionary base for Paul. So yeah, so that's just, that's the gospel going out, saving not just Jews, but Gentiles also. But I just want to take a minute just to look at these, these preachers who were actually preaching to them. I mean, there, there is, we don't actually get a lot about them, but I kind of think that's a good thing, because they didn't need to be special to go and do the will of God where they were. Like, they weren't, you don't, we don't even know their name. And like, anybody who's really named and Anybody who's anybody, I guess, in a sense, is named in the book of, Ante- is, is, sorry, is named in the book of Acts. But you don't even get these guys' names. All we know really is that they're from Cyprus and Cyrene. So maybe they joined, maybe they were among the group that joined the church at Pentecost. Uh, we know that they were scattered um, after the persecution that arose over Stephen. And so one thing that we could look about them is the fact that they were from Cyprus and Cyrene. So they weren't actually... Um, from Jerusalem. So they, they, would, they would have known things about like, the Greek mindset. Um, so in a way, I guess, they were kind of being prepared, they were prepared just from their cultural background to go and minister to the people um, that maybe some of the other people in Jerusalem weren't. They were in a, they were in a way ready to go and min- give the gospel to the Gentiles. So I think that's kind of an encouragement to me because, you know, in your life, maybe before you come to Christ, you don't know exactly, you know, you don't know, you don't, you don't know the way that God's been preparing you for things. But these guys, you know, they've been growing up and they've been developing actually a mindset, knowing the language that would enable them to go and be effective ministers of God later on in their lives. And that's just an encouragement, I think, to us that, you know, we don't, we don't always know the way that we're going to be used when we're doing the things that we're doing, but God does know. And another thing, these guys, they don't really seem to be, you know, they weren't really sent out in the sense of, um, like, we don't see a church sending them out as such. We just see them, they were scattered, and they were preaching. So they're just being faithful where they were. So they were, they were being independent and t- taking the initiative. You know, there's no, I mean, th- there's a link in terms of the book to what happens before, in that Peter gives the, gen- Peter and preaches the gospel to Cornelius. So then we see a Gentile being saved, and this is kind of like the next step of that. But there's no, like, clear, we don't see, like, that necessarily they, they heard this happen, and then they kind of thought, okay, now we have to go and do the same thing. Um, I think really, all we really know is they saw people in need, and they had the gospel, so they knew that these people need saving from their sins, and they knew that they had the word that could do it, and they gave it to them. 
So we don't know, I mean, we don't know exactly what's happening, but they, they could have even found this in the Word. We even see this, like, it, this is not, it's not exactly a, a new thing. Um, like, throughout the Bible, even the Old Testament, we see God reaching out to Gentiles. Even in Isaiah 49, verse 6, you know, God basically says, it would be a light thing for me to save Jewish people. I'm going to save the Gentiles as well and get glory in that. So like, this, is, this, is, this, is not like a, this is not like a new thing that God wants to save the Gentiles. So maybe they were just reading their word or maybe they just, maybe they just thought about it, but somehow something happened and then they just decided independently to go out and preach to Gentiles. But so that's like, so that's these people. Like, there's nothing special about them. They just saw a need. They, they saw that they had a faithful God and they knew they had the word, that they, they knew that they'd be saved and they wanted to go preach to others. But then why was their ministry so successful? Like, what, what happened why they were able to go and plant this church successfully? And we see the answer to that in verse 21, where it says, sorry, in verse 20 and 21, where it says, And the hand of the Lord is with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So this was what they had. This is what they had with them, why they were successful. They had the hand of the Lord with them. And this is all we need, like, to do anything. It's actually crazy when you think about the fact that God wants us to rely on him, the fact that we need God for everything. It's crazy to think how much we can try and do without God sometimes in our life. When Jesus says, apart from him, we can do nothing. Apart from abiding in him, we can do nothing. So it can be really crazy to think of how much, you know, how much effort we put into kind of building up ourselves and putting our plans into place when all we need is the hand of the Lord. And like, like I said, that these, guys, like these, these were unnamed people because it wasn't, and I think that's a cool thing because it's, like, it's almost like God's telling us this, is, this wasn't about them. This was about what the Lord did through them because the Lord was with them. And so and I think it's important for us, like in this day, not just in the church, in the whole world, being a celebrity can be a big thing. Like people, people attach a lot of value to having a famous name and being a somebody. But in this text, these are nobodies doing this. And so I think when we look at this, we should definitely be encouraged not to be comparing ourselves or our ministry to others. We shouldn't be trying to approach ministry the way, trying to achieve set, like success in the way that the world tries to achieve success. We, you know, because God doesn't look necessarily for the best guy for the job. In fact, he probably looks for the worst guy for the job so that he will look better when he does it. And so, and, and the apostles thought this way. I mean, these are the, the apostles were the big name people. Like, think about P- Peter and Paul, and they were constantly having to tell people, like, no, I'm not somebody. You know, this, this is First Peter, um, the verse, in fact, this is the first verse in First Peter. It's kind of like the first thing he says. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's, that's, that's the New King James reading. Or of another translation, it says, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Peter, is, Peter wants to start, even in one of his letters, he wants to start you off by knowing, yeah, maybe you think I have a name or something, but we're, before Christ, we're the, in Christ we're the same. We have the same, exact same standing, the exact same thing that God could do through Peter, he could do through you. And another, th- so we shouldn't, we shouldn't be comparing ourselves to others in that. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't be feeling like either that like we're unnecessary. Like these guys, they didn't know, you know, they, they, they may have not been the big names in the church, but they were very necessary. This was a big thing that God did through them. And we are all members of the body of Christ and God may use us in one place, in one way, or another place in another. He may, bring us up, he may bring us up and give us a name to do something, or he may just do something through us as we live quietly. It's not about us. It's not about, it's, it's not about us. It's not about what, um, what we're able to do. It's about what we can do in Jesus. And it's because, and you know, this is, I mean, if you're seeking your own glory, that might bother you. But if all you're really concerned about is glorifying God, that's a joy to you because wherever you are, you know that you're bringing glory to him. And you know that he's pleased with you. And that's the, that's the starting point. And in fact, just on a, on a thing about, thinking about having a big name kind of in church, 
it was often a problem in the church when, when like, like I was saying, when the big names did kind of, when the big names did kind of, um, when, when people did kind of get big, uh, in, in Paul's, you know, in Paul's letter to the to the first Corinth, in, in sorry, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, he's actually having to, he's having to settle disputes among people who are kind of saying that they are following people. You know, he says, people, they had, you had people in that church saying, "I'm of Apollos and I'm a Paul, I'm a Peter," and he, Paul's basically saying, "You're not following people, you're following Jesus. So why are you elevating people to where he should be?" So named, having a big name in church, or in anything really, can actually cause more harm than good. And also, the big names were the people who, we actually see, and it's funny to think, the big names, you know, Peter and Paul, for example, they were the people that actually needed probably the most goading. Like, they, they needed the most prodding and encouragement. Paul was on his way to persecute Christians before Jesus changed him and gave him a vision. He was literally, he, he had to be blinded and he had to be blinded and like starved for food for three days before he kind of ended up following Jesus and doing what he was supposed to and doing his will in that sense. You know, if you think about, if you think about the, like the effort that it kind of took for Peter to even preach the gospel, the gospel to Gentiles, he's um he he has to have a vision here, then Cornelius one's over there, and it's kind of like a whole big thing. It's not like he just went and did of his own volition. So it's some, you know, just, just because people do have the big name, it doesn't mean like they're any more spiritually advanced in that way. It's, in fact, some, in these kind of cases, it looks like it might be the opposite, it's the opposite at times. Yeah, and that's really the whole point. Like the power, you know, the power is not in people. The power is in Jesus' name. And I, another, just another occasion that it reminds me of is just thinking about the disciples kind of arguing about who was going to be the greatest. Like in, I mean, just imagine that, like Jesus walking in front of you and you're arguing who's going to be the greatest. And, the, and I just love the way that Jesus settles the argument. <laughs> I love the way. So I'm just, I'm just going to read a bit out of Luke for this one. He says, that The dispute arose among them as to which of them w- would be the greatest like, in the kingdom. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, he took a little child and set him by him and said to them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you will be, the, will be great. So he takes this little child and he puts them. And you're basically saying like, do you think, is there anything great about this child? Why you think that people listen to him? And I guess they'll say no. But he's saying, look, even if this child came in my name, people would receive you. It's not about you, it's about my name. Okay, it's in my name that people receive you. And it's just, I mean, it's just, it was so, it's so humbling but it's also, so, like, it's also so gracious just to know that if you make yourself the least, that you will be great because Jesus will be seen through you. And that's not to say that God hasn't given people gifts, um, but it's always for the sake of glorifying him and glorifying Christ. Another thing we see about them is that they were scattered because of the persecution. I remember, so Pastor Darren was preaching about this before, and he was, he was just giving, he, was, he, brought up, um, he brought up the famous, the, the Joseph's, uh, Joseph's quote when he says that his brothers, when his brothers meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And that's just such a good reminder. These, these people, they were, they, were, they, weren't, they were scattered because of persecution. And they were still faithful to go and do what God had called them to do. And that, that's even more like Joseph. When Joseph was, in, he, when he was sold as a slave and he was imprisoned, he was, still faithful to, he was still faithful to God in that situation. And so it's only, he, he, him saying you meant it evil for, and God meant it for good was not saying, um, you know, that, he's, that he was just completely benefiting from this. He was saying, even though even though that you meant it for evil, he was still going to stay. He could still stay faithful in that. And like I said, we, we have the benefit of hindsight. You know, we see this. We see the Holy Spirit inspiring this book and putting it all together in a way that we can understand what's happening. But these guys didn't have that. These guys were literally just. They saw. You know, they saw people being. They saw their. They saw Christians being persecuted, and they had to flee for their lives. And they were preaching at the in at the danger of their own lives, but they were just being faithful where they were. You know, they weren't even saying, you know, oh yeah, God's going to do this. God's doing this particular amazing thing through us. Um, 
They, weren't, they, weren't, they didn't know God's particular will for it, but they did know God's will in general, that that is what they would be doing. So they were following God's will in that, even not knowing the details of exactly what God was doing. And so we don't always, you know, we don't need to go the de- we don't need to know the details, but we do need to know that God, because we, we know that God is faithful, and that we know that He's called us to do something, and that's enough for us. And so, I, I mean, that's an encouragement to me because, if if ever in your life you do feel maybe how they might have been feeling at this time at the, of the, at when they were scattered, imagine you they may have been feeling like they don't know, they don't know what's going on, you know, they they maybe feel. I mean, imagine feeling scattered. You feel aimless. You feel lost. But, they, but, but despite that, but despite that, they still stayed faithful. And then next, we see the, so that's, the church, that's really the church being planted by these kind of unspectacular people, but the hand of the Lord is with them. And they were preaching being faithful even in persecution. And then next we see this reaches Jerusalem. So this reaches the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And then they respond by sending out Barnabas to go and build up, really, this church in Antioch. So why, why did they go and send someone? Why didn't they just say, oh, that's, you know, they didn't, hear, they didn't hear the church was planted, and they were like, okay, that's a cool thing. And they didn't even... You know, they didn't just go and celebrate or anything. They just actually, they, go, they sent someone over there. So I think there are a few reasons why. One of the, one of the reasons, I think, is to, was just to confirm the events because they're just hearing about this, right? And one of the reasons I think this is because when Barnabas gets there, he's glad after he gets there, but he's not glad before he gets there. He goes and sees what God has done first, and then he's glad. So it's almost like seeing it is like the confirmation of what he heard. Um, so then, I th- so I think that's part of the reason, just to kind of confirm the whole thing. Like this is actually what, like what they've heard was pre- like legit. But I also think it's to, not, like in terms of the book, I think is to keep the connection um, from the Antioch church with the with the work that Jesus had started with the apostles. Um, we we see this whenever a church or some people do receive the gospel, people are sent out from Jerusalem to go to them, and that they would receive the Spirit in as the, as the case sometimes, or that they, they would. That they, would, that they would go and um, teach them or something, or, or, like, or something like that. For example, the apostles sent you know, Peter and John to the Samaritans when they heard that they received it, uh, and they prayed for them. Um, so that's the, and that's how, and the way it happens was that the church in Jerusalem sent them out. So it's almost like we're seeing um, the church in Jerusalem is kind of like the main thing, and then, other pe- then the rest of the church kind of, the rest of churches kind of flow out from that. So it's kind of all keeping it connected to that same thing that Jesus started back in chapter 1. So that's why I think they sent them. But then why did they send Barnabas? And, you know, I don't, why didn't they send some of the other people, like Peter or John or something like that? I don't, and I don't think it was because they were sending second best, because this was a man who, as the text says, he was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. You know, and he's, he's well attested. You know, he's got, he does, he's, no, he's known for doing... He's known for being an encourager. This was the, he was the person who sold his land to lay at the feet of the apostles. So he's got like a good name. Like he's, got some, he's got a lot of good qualities. In the, in the, he's, he's spoken of highly in the book. I think one of the reasons was because, similar to the people who planted the church, he may have been culturally more suitable. Um, he was a Jew, a Levite, in fact, as we see in Acts chapter th- um, 4, verse 36. But he's also from Cyprus. So he was similar to, those, to see, similar to those other Jews from Cyprus and Cyrene. He may have had like a better understanding of like the Greek culture, um, a bit, another understanding of the Hellenists, so to speak. So he may have been able to go and better minister to them than some of the maybe people who grew up in the area of Judea. And he's also, as we see, he will be doing later, he's an encourager, a son. His, his name translated means son of encouragement, you know, basically Mr. Encouragement. So that's why I think Barnabas was sent. And when he goes, and when he goes, I love this. When he goes, he sees the grace of God. And this is one of like, a, this is like one of our the main things I want us to think about, really, like as a church and even our own lives. Is that if we, if people looked at us, would they come and be able to see the grace of God? 
So you have to think, well, what does that even mean? How do you see the grace of God in someone? Well, I th- to, before, just to back up a bit, I think, in the, I think what, we, what we're talking about here, when we talk about the grace of God in this context, I think that he's talking about mainly about the grace in terms of the gift of repentance for the Gentiles. As we see in the previous chapter, Acts verse 11, when Peter basically he recounts what God has done to the Gentiles and the, guy, the people listening to him the, of the circumcision party in, the, in Jerusalem, they say, well then, I guess to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance leading to life. So God has granted them that as a grace, as the same way that it's granted to us as a grace. And so I think that's what they're talking about. And we see the, those, you know, so we see that, you know, the believers turn and there's, in a sense, repent. So that, that grace is given to them. Um, there are other ways where grace is used. Grace is used in terms of being given a grace. Paul, for example, in Romans, a, great, a, a, gift, a grace could be referring to a gift of the Spirit used to build up the church. Um, in Romans, Paul t- talks about grace is given to people um, having different gifts according to the grace given to them. Let's use them. If prophecy, pro- then prophesy in, 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 um, in proportion to our faith. In ministry, then in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So all those things, you know, um, prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, those are graces given by God to build up the church. So, but I think in this context, we're talking about the repentance which leads to life, as we've seen in Acts chapter 11, verse 18. So one thing, when we talk about this repentance, this, is, this was a gift of God, and we see them believe and they repent. You see, when we receive the gospel, we don't, you know, we don't just believe, we turn also. It's a turning away from our old lives. We see that we accept, as God tells us, that we are all sinners and we've all fallen short of that glory. And then we believe that. We believe that Jesus came to be the propitiation, the payment for our sins so that we do not have to pay for ourselves because we cannot pay for ourselves. God, God is, that's a grace of God given to us that we should even be able to have life when we know that we deserve death. And, but it's not just the accepting of Jesus as our Savior. It's not just accepting Jesus as our payment for sin. It's also turning to him and making him the Lord of our life, turning away from the old stuff that was leading to death and then turning to him, turning to follow him. And so those, and we, we see those people, the church in Antioch, doing this because a great number of them believed and turned to the Lord. And so that gift of repentance, these guys took it. So I think... That is what Barnabas was seeing. He was seeing people turn to the Lord. He was seeing people repent. He was seeing people turn away from their old lives and instead live a life, a new life in Christ. So now I was just thinking like, okay, so, they, so he's, seeing, he's seeing repentance. He's seeing the grace of God. So, he's not re- so I think the one way to be think about this could be saying that he sees the grace of God in the way that people respond to the grace of God. So he sees the grace of God in these people in the way that the people are, have received the grace of God and then it has now changed them so that they do not look the same anymore. So we don't see a particular, we don't see a particular you know, way in which he sees it. But I just, I was just, based, just biblically, I'm thinking, to, I was, I'm thinking what, you know, what would that look like? And I think the main thing that I could think of when I was, when I was just, going through the Bible, just thinking, what's the real mark? What's the mark of someone who has received the grace of God and is, and is now changed? And I think it's love. Love for others, particularly, of the, particularly the brothers and sisters in the church, is the mark of a believer. And I think that's, so what, this is, this is, this is what happens when people receive the grace of God. They see that we, we receive love that we do not re- deserve. And then in light of that, we go and give love to other people, regardless of whether they deserve it or not. We think of, chapter in, I was just thinking of um, passages like First John, first, book of 1 John, chapter 4, verses 11 to 12, say, which says, If in Jesus God has loved us like this, and I know how, sorry, no. Okay, no, that's what I'm saying. So they, but in, 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 we see that in, in um, 1 John chapters, 
uh, for 1 to 12, uh, which I don't have in front of me right now. Oh, here he is. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. So that verse says, no one has ever seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God abides in us. So that's how we know. That's how we know, because if we love one another, then God abides in us because his love has been perfected in us. And the idea of perfected is that it's come to its proper destination. So, that, so it's like God loved us, and this is what his love was supposed to do in us. His love was supposed to cause us to love one another in response to him. So no one, so no one has seen God, but people would be able to see his love in you in your response to him. And that's what I think is going on in this church. I think, that, I think they're, they're, they're seeing the grace in Jesus that they, that they do not deserve, that they're looking saying, okay, so in, in Jesus, I am so loved by God. I'm going to love other people like this, and then they're not going to live the same. I think Barnabas goes and sees that. We see something similar in Colossians um, chapter 1, verses 3 to, verses 3 to 8. It's, I'm just going to be a summary. But Paul hears the report of the love of the Colossians, and that's the thing that confirms to him that they're saints. That's the thing that confirms to Paul that they're saints, when they see the love that they have for each other, and that, that's where he says, okay, I know these guys are responding to the gospel now. And in 1 Thessalonians, you know, Paul says he doesn't even need to teach, uh, he doesn't need to teach them anything about the love because God has taught it to them, and they're already practicing it. So he says that that's a, this is the natural thing that God is going to teach you when you respond to the gospel. And so that's what this, I, believe, I think this church is kind of, I think, I think that's the thing this church is kind of demonstrating. So I'm thinking about in my life, and in, as, as a church, is that the thing that we're going to be known for? Are we going to be known for loving one another? And, and love doesn't mean just when it's easy. Love means when someone doesn't deserve it. Love means, love means when people wrong us, and we can actually look to Christ and say, oh yeah, I have been wronged. I, really, I truly have been wronged, but I've been forgiven of so much more. And then I can go and be gracious to others in light of that. So that's what I think is on display here. And, I, and I, my prayer for me and for us is that we would be a church that displays the grace of God to others. If, it, if someone was to come in here and see that. And I think it's evident in two ways we're going to see. In, sorry, in one way we're going to see mainly in this. And we're going to see, we're going to see in generosity later. Um, because love will be evident in generosity. In the in sense of giving, even though people, just despite deserving, despite the other person being deserving, giving freely as God has given to us. And so when Barnabas comes, so he sees the grace of God, and he's glad. And then, true to his name, he encourages them all. He encourages them all that with purpose and heart they should continue with the Lord. So Barnabas was an encourager, and he encouraged. But just because we don't, you know, necessarily, you know, he's known for encouraging, but we can, I, I think encouraging is really important. And just because, you know, we may not feel particularly gifted necessarily at encouraging, doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Um, like, it makes a difference. In fact, in that list of the Romans, in the Romans, um, in those graces that I talked about from Romans 12, that Paul was talking about, the gifts of God, the grace in, in the sense of being a gift of God that he uses to build up the church. Exhortation is listed among them. An exhortation basically means to strongly encourage. So imagine that. God has, I think sometimes we focus on, when we think about giftings of the Spirit, we focus on maybe the more visible things like tongues and, you know, those kind of healings and things. But imagine that God has given his Holy Spirit to you and worked in you the miraculous gift of being able to encourage someone else. It's, I mean, that, that tells me that it's more than just like a little thing. That tells me that it's, it's, it's pretty necessary, right? He uses it to build up his church. He uses it to build up his people. And so think about how important, pers- I mean, sorry, think about how important encouragement can be, you know? Someone who's maybe, someone who's, I mean, we don't, we don't know we don't know what people are always, we don't know what goes on in people's minds. We don't know what goes on in people's hearts. You know, especially maybe in our culture where, you know, we're pretty, you know, if someone asks you how you're doing, you don't tell them really how you're doing. You tell them, fine. 
Okay, so in that, you know, we, we do, you don't even know necessarily the encouragement that someone needs. So I think, it's what, I think we should be encouraging even when, you know, nothing's obviously wrong. Like this, this church here, nothing, we don't see anything necessarily wrong here going on, but Barnabas still comes and encourages them. He encourages them to stand fast. He encourages them to remain. You know, and so it's almost like encouragement can even be preventative. It can even be like just building up before something happens, or before someone is, you know, before someone is facing someone, they're already going to be encouraged to be able to, to be equipped for that. You know, um, I'm just thinking about, I mean, encouragement is another thing that you go through, for example, the New Testament. It's just time and time again, you see people being encouraged. After, after Paul's imprisonment, so imagine Paul has been imprisoned. Paul's been imprisoned um, in Philippi. And, so he's, and he comes out, and he knows that people are going to be worried about him. So he's trying to encourage them whilst he's in prison that they wouldn't be worried about him and they wouldn't shake their faith. I think about after the, after the riot in Ephesus. So in, there's a riot in Ephesus, and it's, like, it's just madness, and people are like, what's going on? And then Paul goes, and then even though at, it would be dangerous for him, Paul goes back to the church in Ephesus so that they would be confident and encouraged and strong in their faith. And the same thing, we, see, we, we constantly see Paul when he goes to, he's already, to the churches he's already planted, he goes back, and the, the, one of the things that we see noted, for example, Acts, we're going to see this later in Acts, for example, Acts chapter 20, he goes through churches, the thing that it says that he does there is encourage them. Like, he doesn't say, I mean, I imagine he may have done many things. You know, he may have, he may have just like, um, taught, he may have taught them, he may, he may have taught them, he may have done man, many other things, but the one, the one of the things that he notes that he does is that he encourages them. So that encouragement is very important. And I'm thinking particularly for this church, I mean, for us, I mean, in the West where we live, we don't face persecution in the way that this church may have faced back then. Many, many, many Christians in the world do. So encouragement is very important, as we've seen in those other texts, when Paul was being persecuted, to be able to withstand and be strong in the face of persecution. I mean, this is like this is this is a, this was a, this is a reality for many people today, and in their and because and think about this church here, this church here, they're 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 a new church. They're not they're, they're 300 miles north of Jerusalem, so they're not they're not even that close to their brothers and sister their brothers and sisters down there. They're in the midst of a big city, which is actually known for its immorality. Um, so imagine they, they're going to need they're going to have to be strong. You know, they're going to have to stand fast. And so encouragement is going to be nece- necessary for that. And maybe the challenges we face aren't the same as, th- as those, um, you know, facing physical persecution. But we also need encouragement to be able to remain firm in the Lord. It's something that God has appointed for that. So that's what Barnabas goes and does. But the, th- the thing about, there's another thing I want to note about this encouragement. And it's it's a bit more, this isn't just general encouragement that Barnabas gives. He doesn't just say, well done guys, keep going. Uh, You know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. He doesn't say, you guys are amazing. You know, keep, he doesn't say, he gives them a a a specific encouragement that he sees. That with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. That encouragement is something that the world cannot give. This, this, this encouragement that he gives is Christ-centered and it's true. You see, I feel like, you know, there are actually, there are a lot of people in this world that actually do try and encourage. There's actually, I think, how, I mean, there's just so many motivational speakers you know, you see these kind of positive messages on train stations, like, you're amazing, you know, be, be the light that you want to be, or something you know, along those lines, or whatever. But the, the encouragement that we have to give in Christ is just so much better than that. I mean, I, if, I'm, if I'm feeling, like, weak, and I'm feeling like I don't know what's going on, it doesn't tell me any, it doesn't really do me any good to say, Jaden, you're amazing, because... I know you are lying. <laughs> but if you tell me Jesus is amazing, that's a whole different story. Because that's true. 
and I can bank on him. Okay, so I, I don't want to, I guess when I'm saying encourage, when I'm saying we want to encourage each other, I don't just want to encourage us with a light encouragement. I want to encourage us with real encouragement that is based on Jesus and based on the gospel. Like we, sh- we can encourage each, one, in each other to stay faithful because God is faithful. That's why, he can, that's why he can say this. He can say with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord because they're in the Lord and the Lord isn't going to let them down. So they just need to continue depending on him. You know, they shouldn't just be, they shouldn't try to, they shouldn't try to do anything without him. And they shouldn't, they, they should, they've found, they've found him. They've made it. That's it. But now just continue. He is faithful, so stay faithful. That is, that is just an infinitely better encouragement than the world can ever give. And I think we should be thinking this way. You know, and I think the world needs this encouragement too because there are people, like I said, like there are people who, I mean, people like feeling down, people, there are people who just feel down, there are people who go through things in this world that are difficult. And it is the, it will be, it could, it's so easy, it's so easy to give kind of cliches and platitudes in those times, you know, just like, you'll get through this, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I believe in you, I know you will. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying those are always bad, but I'm saying we just have something so much better than that that the world needs that encouragement too. Like, why would we give them, why would we give anyone second best when we have the best thing? Like we have a joy based on an eternal rock and on his, who does not change and will never, ever change. So we should, I think we should be telling the world that. So that's the encouragement that Barnabas gives. Remain faithful to the Lord and continue. Well, then we see that the church, so we, he sees that the church is encouraged, but the church isn't just encouraged, the church is also taught. So Barnabas goes, in, in verse 25, we see Barnabas goes to Tarsus to seek Saul. And I, love this, and I love this about Barnabas too, you know, he's always kind of like the link-up guy. He's, these, guys, these guys are really necessary. Uh, also, you know, the, the, the people that kind of just connect people. Um, so he's, here we see him connecting Saul with the church in Jerusalem. I mean, we, here we see him connecting Saul with the church in Antioch. In Acts 9.27, we see him connecting Saul with the church in Jerusalem because we know that Saul was a Christian persecutor. He went to Damascus to go and persecute Christians, like, deliberately. He, like, he wanted to go and do this. He got... He got a sign saying, please, can I go and persecute them? And he went to go and do that. And so, understandably, the Christians who heard about him, who he was persecuting in Jerusalem, did not trust him. But Barnabas actually was the link-up guy in that case. He, when, when Paul did end up going to Jerusalem, Barnabas was the guy who kind of commended him to them. and said, no, he has truly changed. Like he, he has been preaching that Jesus is the Christ. So this link-up work, Barnabas has been building up. He builds up in encouragement. He also builds up in that way just by connecting people, connecting the kind of parts of the body with each other. And here we see him doing that again. Um, and he kind of goes to actually look for Saul. Um, I don't know Greek, but apparently the lit- lit- more literally the word in Greek is to, it means like to hunt him up. Like he put effort into this search. Like Saul's in Tarsus, which is a ways away. And so he actually, he, he sees, he wants, he, he goes through effort to find Saul. And it's because he knows that Saul is such a good teacher. The man who wrote most of our New Testament, like breaking down the Old Testament, and showing us who Christ is from the Old Testament, saying us how we should live now, who had his revelation revealed by God. He knows that that teaching, in the same way that it's necessary for us, was necessary for these guys then to remain in the truth and to stand fast as a church. And it's actually been a while um, since we have last seen Saul, I mean, in, in this book, we, he was, we last see him <coughs> shipped off um, to Tarsus. But it's, this has actually been like a number of years that Paul's been in Tarsus. So maybe Barnabas, it has been like quite a, that it has been quite difficult to actually find him. It has actually been quite difficult to find him, but he makes that effort to search because the good teaching he knows is worth the effort. Because as much as Barnabas could encourage he knows that we can't just run on encouragement. We need the truth too. So our faith is based on truth. Our faith is based on what we see in the word of God. And Barnabas knows that. So he gets Paul, the expert, who can show 
people, as he does for us, that from, break, from the, like Paul was an expert in Scripture. Paul's an expert in Scripture, and he, he was showing people, this is why he was being persecuted by so many people, from the Scriptures, he was proving to them that Jesus was the Christ. And that's what these people would need. These people would need to know from the unshakable word of God what they believed in. And that's the same for us. Good teaching is important, and we should, pay, and we should be seeking out good teaching. You know, wherever we are, if, you know, whether, um, whether here or if, if you ever go out anywhere else, make sure that if you, if you're going to, if you were to find a church, that the, te- that the teaching that you, do find, that, you do, that you do get is good teaching, that it's biblical teaching. I mean, because if, th- if you think about it, what is the main tactic that the enemy is going to use to knock you out of your faith or knock your faith out of you? He's going to use lies. This is what the enemy does. He accuses. He, he lies. He's, he's, a, he's been a murderer from the beginning, and he's a liar and the father of lies. There's no truth in him. It's how he deceived Adam. It's how he deceived Eve and Adam. And that's the same thing he does to us. He lies. And so we, if we are going to stand against the lies of the devil, we need the truth. And the truth is in the word of God. And this is why God has appointed teachers as a, as a gift to the church, um, as we see in Corinthians and Ephesians. Um, God has appointed teachers who, can, who are maybe gifted in the sense of breaking down the word and showing the truth of his word to people. So that's a gift to the church, as Paul is, as Paul is going to be here. So this church now, so it's been planted, it's been encouraged, and now it's being taught. And then we see this. We see um, in verse 26, the end of it, that the disciples were first, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, this is a very sweet thing. <laughs> like this was, the, so the people in Antioch, they kind of had a, they were known for their sense of humor. So this was supposed to be a joke, but maybe you don't get the joke because what's, <laughs> what, is, what is that, you know, what, what, that doesn't mean anything to us th- these days. But actually, the word e, the the kind of suffix ian, um, had had kind of a different it had two mean, it had two meanings as I understand. One was that it had it was related to like a political affiliation. Um, so to say, like if you kind of followed, maybe for us, if you follow a political party like Conservative or Labour, you'll be you could be like a Labour ian, for example. So this was kind of their way of saying. So these people were known. These people were known for saying that Jesus was their king that Jesus was their Lord. So people would see them and be like, oh, look at this, it's those, it's those jesus Ians. it's those people who are calling Jesus their king. <laughs> and so they were known for that, and I think that's such a sweet thing. And my, especially kind of like, I mean, just for me, I was thinking about this, like in our political kind of climate today, where there's so much chaos, and no one seems to know what's going on, and we can actually say confidently, like, no, Jesus is my king, I'm a member of his eternal kingdom, so I'm really not worried about any of this, <laughs> what's going on the, in those depressing newspapers. So... Yeah, I, I just love that. So that they kind of meant it as a joke, but then these people took the name one and they were proud of it. They were like, this is the coolest thing. We're, we're being known for being, being called like Jesus and having Jesus as our king. You know? And another thing, like, it's a, the other way we see being Christian being used as actually as a legal charge. Um, for example, if you think about First Peter and um, verse 14 to 16, you know, he says, if any of you is charged with being a Christian, then honor, is it honor, God, um, honor God in that name. So he's saying, like, you're being charged with being a Christian. Like, it's, it's, this, this is something that, it was never like a positive thing that we see that people were calling them Christians, but they took it as a good thing, and they, and they were proud of that. So I just love the, f- and, that's, and that's just another thing that I want to think about. Like, if people, like, if people looked at us, would they see that? Like, if people looked at us, would they say, that's a Christ follower? He's banking his everything or her everything on Christ. Like he's following him. Despite what's going around in the world, he is following Christ. And he just to be so known for that. Like, uh, it's, it's also my, it's my prayer that that would be just true in all of our lives. That we'd be known and be willing and joyful about following Christ, even if people think it's a joke. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they were really doing here. They were mocking them and they wore the label with pride. Uh, yeah, and I, I just uh, thinking about that, just, you know, just the label Christian, like, it, it's kind of, it's one of those things, like, it doesn't, 
you know, one of the reasons why I like this when I see it there was because like, this, was, this really had a meaning to them. Because, the, you know, a lot of times, especially if you grew up with Christian or with the label Christian in your life, it's just like you kind of just, you kind of just take it as um, like an extra piece of t- to your identity, you know. Um, almost like, it's, it's almost like it's something along the lines of, you know, what, fo- what football club do you support? Yeah, I'm, you know, I f- support this, I support this, I support this. And it's like, yeah, w- what religion are you? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Like it's something you just kind of attach to the rest of what you're doing. But so it's not like, so for us, when we do it like that way, it's kind of like backwards. It's like we're taking the name on ourselves. It's like we're just kind of saying, okay, that's a, that's a name, I'm going to take it. But these guys, it was the other way around for them. These guys were living Christianity, and then they were called Christians, rather than just calling themselves Christians and then living however they wanted. But that's the exact opposite. So I just love that idea, and I was like, and what if we could actually flip that? You know, So not just call ourselves Christians, but actually just be Christians and let other people call us the Christians. They would actually be known for being like Jesus. So that's it. So this, and so this church, they've, so this is like how the church has been built up so much this stage and then to the point where they're actually known for being like Jesus. And then we see this. In the, so then after about, we see that they were actually, for like a year, Paul and, Paul and Barnabas were there. Um, then we get this prophet come down, or a number of the prophets, but among them, among them Agabus, who we'll see later as well um, in the book of Acts, but here, he stands up and he shows by the Spirit that there's going to be a famine throughout all the world. And this, and this happened. This, this, this happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Uh, you can read about that. Um, so this fam- th- th- there's this famine that happens, and then these disciples, they all decide, we're going to give to these brothers in Judea um, according to everyone according to their means. So this church... You need to know, this famine didn't just happen in Judea. This famine happened in the whole world. So this church, this church, they're seeing, they're going to be in need. They're going to be hit by this famine too. They're going to be in need too by this famine. But they're, they're not thinking about themselves. They're thinking about their brothers and sisters in Judea, who they might not even meant. Like, this is real sacrificial love. This is, despite the fact that they're going to be hurt by their giving, they're still going to give. Like, this is what the gospel produces in people selfless love and generosity in christ we have received what we have do not deserve and we can give we can give with confidence in our eternal security if they were to if they were to die because of their giving they know that they are going to be received in heaven because they have a faithful god who died for them and is paid for them that they might live forever so they can give like that they're free to give like that they're free to serve and love their brothers and sisters Another thing is that this, this is an example, I think, of God using the body in different ways. See, the church in Judea, they were mostly poor. So they wouldn't have had, they would have been worse hit by the famine. Like the famine, the famine was everywhere, but the church in Judea would have been worse hit by the famine. So these, this church, these, these people in Antioch, actually, they may have had, maybe some of them more did have more means. So they were actually blessed, in a sense, with the resources that they had. So they could go and actually give to, they, they could go, and do their part for brothers and sisters in a different situation to them. So maybe this is just something for us to think about. Like, what, what do we have that we could give to bless other brothers and sisters? You know, we may, we, we, are not, we, don't, we don't all have the same thing. We don't all have the same gifts, you know. Um, some of us have, may have abilities that other people do not have. And God has given us that for the building up of the body. Um, God has made us, given us resources, time, money, you know, uh, some kind of connection with people uh, any, or any other spiritual gift. But God gives gifts for the building up of the body and we should see those as gifts for the building up of the body so that we actually are looking always to see how can I be a blessing to others. And that is what, so if you think about this church has gone, you know, from being, from being living, think about in, in the kind of one of the most immoral cities of Antioch, going from living that, from being a part of that, They've had the gospel preached to them. Now they've, they've listened to that. They've been changed. They've been taught. They've been encouraged. And now they're actually going to give of their selves for their brothers and sisters. 
And I just think that's an amazing story in like 12 verses. And this church which will go on to be so influential. So I just want to pray for us. I just want to pray for us that we would be encouraged in the Lord and that we would be encouraged to remain faithful and that we would also be willing to encourage others in the Lord to remain faithful. And I want to pray for us that we would, that if anyone was, were to look at our lives or look at our church, that they would see the grace of God in us and our lives. And I pray that we would be willing to sacrificially give of ourselves whatever that looks like for us, for other people. So let's pray. God in heaven, we just thank you for this amazing text, Lord. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your willingness to reach out to the lost, Lord, to reach out to people in darkness, God, us, us who were in darkness. But you sent your son. You sent your son to pay for us, even though we did not deserve it. Lord, we've all sinned against you. We've all fallen short. None of us deserve the salvation, Lord. But you give it to us. Lord, you send you send people, you send people to tell us about this, and Lord, you send us to tell other people about this. So Father, I just, I just pray that we will take the encouragements from this text today, take the challenges from this text today, and really apply them to our lives, Lord. I pray that we would be people who encourage other people, and encourage other people with your gospel, Lord, with your good news. Lord, I pray that we would be people who love each other, and that love would be so evident in the way that we forgive each other, in the way that we're gracious to each other, and in the way that we're generous to each other, Lord. So, Father, I just pray really, I guess, in all of that, that it would be a church where people would see your grace in us. And if there is anyone here today who's hearing this and thinking, I have never really received that grace before. I've, you know, I, I haven't, I have, I, have, I have been still just living my own way for my whole life. I want to give you the opportunity today to do that. So it's simple. I mean, if you just have to you just come to God and accept, you are, we are, we are, as, you, as we all are, you are a sinner, and that you are in need of God's forgiveness. You are in need of God's forgiveness, and according to Scripture, that God sent his Son, and Jesus came. Jesus came to be the payment, the payment for your sins, so that you do not have to pay because you cannot pay for the sins that you've committed against God. So if you believe that, if you believe that, then put your trust in Jesus today and turn away from your old life and follow him as your new Lord, who, you're fo- who, who you obey and are willing to follow and be like. So if you, if you want to make that decision today, just pray this prayer with me. Lord in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I do not deserve your grace. But Father, because you are gracious, because you are so merciful, and because you sent your son to pay the penalty, penalty for me, Lord, I accept that, and I want to turn away from my old life and follow you, now, follow you now in this new life that you give. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, I want to accept that gift. Amen.